As Catherine said, I'm an urban sociologist, but I work in an interdisciplinary program. So I'm a sociologist who's fallen amongst architects and designers um, and have, has learnt to speak aspects of your language. I haven't learnt your visual language really fluently, but hopefully your uh, semantic language a little more so. And what I want to do today is firstly choose the right keyboard. I'm going to come back to this image. I just want to set it as a kind of place setter. Um, some of you may recognise this street if you know London. Um, this is a street called Ashman Street in East London in Hackney and it really frames the talk that I want to um, have with you this afternoon. But I'm going to come back and talk through it in more detail in a little while. What I want to do though is hopefully engage with some of the concepts, some of the debates that you've been encountering in thinking about um, ecologies of the city, ecologies of uh, um, urban and non-urban environments, and perhaps bring a more social scientific and uh, social theoretical set of angles to it. So I want to talk through, first of all, perhaps more conceptually, some different approaches to how we might use the metaphor or the concept of ecology in relation to urban environments. My particular interest is in urban settlements, hence the city's program. Um, because I think it's fair to say that ecology is one of the buzzwords of urbanism, both in uh, terms of social theory, political science, also in terms of design at the moment. And it's one of the bio-analogies that we borrow from the biosciences from time to time. We're very familiar, of course, with using the term morphology another concept drawn from biological sciences <coughs> to think about the shape of the city, to think about urban form. But in recent times, the idea of ecology, a different kind of bioanalogy, has become very current. And I want to begin by talking through some of the, the genealogies of that term within social thought, political thought, and design theory. My focus will be on the social ecology of cities, and in particular, um, how these help us to think about the spatial organisation of inequality and difference, whether we're talking about economic inequalities um, or various kinds of social difference in the city. I think the reason why I'm interested in this emphasis on the ecology of inequality is that the concept of ecology, I think, can falsely suggest a sort of harmony, a balance, uh, a system of interdependency. It can be quite a benign bioanalogy to use in thinking about the city. Um, cities like natural systems are not simply balanced, harmonious, coherent, integrated contexts, but highly variegated, uh, marked by contest and, and competition, by fragmentation as much as integration. So I think one of the health warnings I'd want to flag about using the concept of ecology is perhaps the false um, coherence or the false sense of balance and interdependency this might tend to suggest about human environments as much as natural ones. So to begin with this sort of very potted um, genealogy of how ecology is being used and has previously been used in relation to urban settlements. Um, and the first strand of thought I want to point to is urban political ecology. And it's very timely. Catherine was just saying you were expecting Eric Swingerdahl um, as your speaker last time, and he'll be coming along in a couple of weeks' time. And he is one of the leading proponents of this body of work. This is a critical um, political approach to urban environment, largely being developed by geographers such as Eric Swingerdahl and his colleagues in this book, the Nature, In the Nature of Cities, or by Roger Keel in um, his article from 2003 on urban political ecology. That's a really nice piece. And I, the slides will be we posted for you, so you will be able to get all these references down if you want to chase any of them up in the future. So you needn't kill yourself to try and get down all the references at this point. Approaches to urban political ecology, let me put it very briefly because Eric will put it far more um, with far greater erudition and passion in a couple of weeks time. This approach to urban political ecology wants to put into question conventional distinctions between the urban and the natural. 
the built and the natural environments. By thinking rather about cities as a kind of socio-nature, so-called. A pattern of uh, human activity, a pattern of human settlement that goes to work on nature and transforms it in an interactive way rather than something which is, you know, denatured, that is not nature, the other of nature. So cities, urban environments, we can think about in terms of these complex ecologies of different elements, the human built and natural forms. And these systems of distribution, um, concentration and transfer that circulate different kinds of elements in the city, materials, resources, risks, spaces, things, people and vulnerabilities. Um, this is, uh, I should say, my take. This is my kind of encapsulation of the idea of urban political ecology and the different kinds of elements that are circulating within these ecological systems, the human, the non-human, the natural, the material, but also in the way that these distributions um, are not harmonious, not simply these functional interdependencies, as I suggested, but tend to be fairly inequitable. They create disparities, uneven distributions of vulnerability, of risk, um, as well as of benefit and resource. So this is one of the most current takes on the concept of ecology in thinking about urbanism from a, from a critical and from a more um, social theoretical perspective. And this quote from Kiel, this is, this is him now rather than me, captures very well, I think, this idea of, of the, the city as socio-nature. It's not, as we urbanise, it's not simply that we separate ourselves off from the natural world, create spatial frontiers and physical distances, but new and more complex relationships between the two are created for good or ill. But if this is a, a, a very contemporary approach that draws on these bioanalogies, its a special interest is in a critical take on the politics of these kinds of uh, systems. That's where the, the qualifier, the political, comes into it. And here is uh, Swingerdo and his colleagues, Heinen and, and Kaika, Nick Heinen and Maria Kaika, talking about the sorts of inequalities and uneven distributions that occur within this web of social and natural relations. Such that urban political ecologies become really crucial terrains or context for contest and for struggle. They're thinking in particular around, around environmental struggles over land, over water, over urban commons, and so on. But we can think about it more um, generally in terms of struggles over distributions of resources, distributions of space, contests and mobilization over exactly who gets what, where in the city, and the impacts of those activities on the natural, so-called. Now, I hope I've suggested already that this is uh, not in an entirely new way of thinking metaphorically about the city. Within a, uh, classic approaches to urban design, some of the leading um, popular thinkers in the field of urban design, we find the language of ecology quite frequently in use. Lewis Mumford, the great 20th century urban sociologist, a rather cranky, grumpy critic of the impact of cities on their hinterlands and on the natural environment, nonetheless thought about cities as social ecologies, analogous somehow to the, um, the natural ecologies of the animal and vegetable worlds. And Jane Jacobs, in her classic work from the 1960s on the death and life of great American cities, defined the city as organized complexity long before currently more voguish approaches to complexity um, came along. But the person in, in whom I'm most interested in this context, because I think uh, Kevin Lynch, the urban planner, 
who was working really from the 60s onward, based at MIT, is a really key thinker for bridging the planning and design disciplines with social thought. And again, he used this language in his work on good city form in the early 1980s. He wants to think about the city as a complex ecology. And he takes the metaphor further. This is not simply a scientific or an analytical way of thinking about cities. But it is a rubric for thinking about the, the good city and how urban forms might support not just human society, survival, but um, cultural thriving. He, good, those forms are good that allow for development with continuity via openness and connection. The language is very much a kind of one drawn from organic metaphors. Development via openness and via connection. So a complex ecology which is not a bounded system, but is open, subject to change, but also supports forms of continuity. So that is a very, very potted version of, of different ways in which the language of ecology has popped up in design thinking, in critical urbanism in recent years. But the starting point for me as a sociologist is in fact with this um, now very deeply unfashionable approach to human ecology that was developed in the Chicago School of Sociology um, after the first war and sort of just before the second one. So in that interwar period, urban sociology is invented as a discipline, fortunately, um, because this is you know, my sort of starting point as an urban sociologist. Chicago is kind of the hometown for any urban sociologist in that point. It's where the first distinct body of work that takes the city as an object of social inquiry and a special form of human settlement really takes shape. As I say, however, these classic works from the 20s, 30s into the 40s um, are very much out of vogue in contemporary thinking about ecology. But it's the Chicago School sociologists who really coin the use of the term. This was another moment when the social sciences and the spatial sciences were in conversation with what we now call the biosciences. This moment, um, in the interwar period, thinkers like Lewis Worth, who I'm citing here, were very directly drawing on um, new developments in plant sciences and in animal biology to think about the modern city. So there is a kind of parallel with the way in which um, spatial theorists and design theorists now are also engaging with new directions in the biosciences around urban metabolism, around cellular biology, around biomimicry, and so on. This was an earlier encounter between the, the two, but one that we've become a little bit ashamed of because it seemed to be this very scientizing approach to human life. Um, Worth's quote here gets at what he and his fellows in the Chicago School, and they were all fellows pretty much uh, for some time, were concerned with. These processes of concentration, dispersal, segregation, and succession of men, he uses the term um, advisedly, institutions and cultural characteristics. So that's why this approach to ecology is social rather than natural. He's not just interested in humans as if they were ants or as if they were cells. He's also interested in human actors as creators of institutions, as bearers of cultures. So these cultural and organisational political aspects of human settlement also inform his approach to um, the social ecology of cities. So it's not simply a matter of treating urban environments as if they were lab slides and observing movements, dispersals, concentrations, uh, like some great termite mound, but thinking about how institutions and cultures interact with these processes. There's also, you might detect from a quote like that, there's a little hangover of evolutionary thinking in this kind of work as well. And uh, this is one of the reasons, I think, where, why it's become rather unfashionable within current sociological circles. The other reason why this takes the qualifier social, this early urban sociological approach, 
Here he is writing in 1945 when uh, the world might well have been concerned with other things on the subject of human ecology. He says, we're not, you know, we're not so much concerned in thinking about urban ecology, social ecology, human ecology, as of the relationship between people and their habitats, as in the relation between people as that's shaped by their habitats. It's not as sophisticated as current approaches to urban political ecology. And Roger Keel, in that article from 2003, says, you know, we've got to do away with any traces of that old Chicago school thinking. But it is an early attempt to think about how human interactions and human attempts to design their environments are about um, encounters with each other, but also with their habitat, with the natural environment. So where I get to against this kind of backdrop is to think about how spatial divisions, inequalities, get played out within this ecology. So my interest is in trying to disrupt a balanced and integrated concept of ecology by thinking about this in terms of heterogeneity, difference, um, and competition to an extent. Some of you might recognize that this is a very um, classic and, and uh, much quoted and much criticized image in um, a work on the city. There's this classic textbook produced by the Chicago School um, group in the 1920s. And it includes this image of uh, the city. Can anyone recognize what city this is? It's Chicago. It's their hometown. Um, you, you sort of can recognize the Lakeland Shore. I think the only real clues are the loop in the center, the center of Chicago, the CBD known as the loop, and the black belt. Still, well, then so-called, still so-called, that area of concentrated African-American settlement running to the south of the center. But you can see this is a highly stylized <coughs> depiction of an urban environment, and it's meant to be. And it's these kinds of imaginings that have prompted, um, over time, these very strong criticisms of the scientific, the positivistic approaches to um, far more complex realities that the Chicago School were involved in. But what they're trying to depict here, although this is a very static model, they're actually trying to capture the dynamism of cities the way in which successive waves of in-migration movement into and out of the city um, get shaped around particular kinds of uh, settlements. So on one side of the image, you've got this sort of very straight urban planners approach to how the city gets divided up around movements and concentrations of people. Right at the center, there's the zone in transition. Um, it's a low income zone. Uh, settled, you know, around in the inner city are people who are recent settlers. They're maybe not going to stay very long. It's a fairly transient population um, in rooming houses and so on. As you go out, the next loop, the zone of workers' homes, so working class, more settled, established, but still fairly low income districts. And then as you get out into the outer ring, the residential, the sort of comfortably established. Uh, peri-urban, suburbanizing, middle-class zone. And beyond that, the commuters, people who live out in other towns um, or you know, ride out on the peri-urban periphery and commute into the centre for work. So, so far, this is you know, a classic kind of planning approach to urban land economies, um, working towards a suburban, an, an American suburban model. On the other side, though, the Chicago School Group are trying to... Um, socialize this to tell us well who is living here what kinds of people are living here and you can see that they're talking both about socioeconomics they're talking both about class really measured by how large a house you can afford do you live in a bungalow um, do you live in apartment houses or are you in the two flat areas or in the, the boarding houses and, and rooming houses uh, of the inner city but it's also um, an, an ethnic map of the city. Chicago at this time, um, then as now, a major destination for urban immigration. Both urban immigration within the United States, the movement of African Americans from the South to the Industrial North um, in the earlier part of the 20th century, 
Um, that shaped by all the kinds of residential segregations that were in play at the time, but also immigration from outside the United States. So not only is this zone in tradition about transient populations, very low income populations, newly arrived populations, but it's the site of ethnic enclaves, Ch the Chinatown, the Jewish ghetto, Little Sicily, the Italian area, um, slum and vice, not necessarily racialized, but the sort of the criminal uh, bad parts of the city. And as you move out, the second ring of immigrant settlement, where people, once they've become more established in the city, they can afford to move into um, bigger, better housing, they can become uh, more kind of suburban, they move outward. Deutschland, it's its core. And this is referring to German-speaking Jewish immigrants into um, Chicago, this Deutschland area, as he calls it, from various parts of um, Middle and Eastern Europe. And beyond that, as you get out into the middle class residential area, you notice there's no longer any ethnic or cultural markers. The implication being that as you um, settle for a longer period, as you are spatially dispersed throughout the city, you sort of become assimilated. You become, it's a process of Americanization as well. So this is a model of how they think about the social ecology of cities in class terms, in cultural terms in ethnic terms, in terms of um, waves of, of in-migration and then outward settlement and assimilation. It can appear very crude to our eyes almost 100 years later. But the, nonetheless, it gets that uh, the social ecology is one that is highly differentiated. Contests over space, competition over housing and jobs, but also culturally marked differences in the city. Now, the ecology of inequality is not my own term, sadly, but one that was used by uh, Douglas Massey, a US political scientist in the late 1990s. He did a series of work. Massey is the co-author of a book called uh, um, American Apartheid, where he was arguing that uh, segregation in late 20th, early 21st century uh, United States uh, was only deepening, was only getting worse, not in all cities but in many cities, including in um, the desegregated North, in cities like Chicago and in New York. So long after legal segregation had, um, I won't say disappear, but had officially been abolished, racial segregation was continuing to mark US cities um, in, in starker and starker ways. And this piece, The Age of Extremes, is um, a, a very important work in that, that strand of his thinking. So he talks about this ecology of inequality, which he sees appearing in US cities, uh, which is marked by the rich and the poor pulling apart spatially. Socioeconomic segregation, which in the US case is highly marked by race, is, he says, getting worse, not better as we move on you know, decades after the end of official legal segregations in parts of the country. The very rich are becoming more and more concentrated in the city. This is his concentrated affluence. And the very poor are still largely living in poor neighborhoods. Now, the United States is um, a fantastic, uh, I, it's probably not the best term to use. It's an exemplary case to use if you're thinking about urban inequality because, you know, it's, A, it's the richest economy in the world and, B, it's one of the most unequal amongst, um, certainly amongst the advanced economies, far more unequal, for example, than, than European economies, um, although Britain does fairly well on the, uh, or fairly badly, I should say, on the inequality front. Uh, and it's still very visible in terms of spatial segregations in the city. So the kinds of ecologies of inequality that Massey is talking about globally are visible, are legible in urban fabrics such as this. This is Shanghai, the contrast between the vertical city, the rapidly developing um, elite city of affluence, and the low-rise, um, everyday vernacular, low-income city. So we see it in current patterns of urbanization. We see it in a city such as London, as um, the Gherkin in the city of London regards uh, number one Canada, Canada Wharf and uh, its neighbor buildings 
these two financial centres regard each other across this sort of great tract of inner East London uh, where the verticality in this case is given by um, tower blocks of public housing in neighbourhoods of, of quite compacted relative deprivation. So those kinds of, um, the pulling apart spatially of the rich and poor that Massey is talking about is visible in these kinds of urban morphologies. Um, this is on the new development on the outskirts of Mexico City. Again, you see that the landscape of power, to use the sociologist Sharon Zukin's term, and before it, the low-rise um, informal settlement, which is housing workers who are involved in the building effort. Or indeed in downtown Johannesburg, where the, the central business district as was, has, la has become very run down in the last 20 years, um, a great deal of dilapidation and vacancy, and um, an increasing uh, sphere of informal economic activity and uh, low income residential settlement. But there are sort of fingers of gentrification reaching in to central Johannesburg again. And that more complicated story, I think, is the one that I want to turn to next. Or we see these kinds of stark disparities, pavement dwellers on a main street um, in uh, Mumbai, or the daily crush to catch the bus in Sao Paulo, which is the city that has the highest level of daily commutes by helicopter for any city in the world. So these kinds of vast disparities within cities and within very proximate spaces is the kind of um, ecology of inequality that Massey is interested in. His text comes from the United States, but we can see comparable kinds of patterns in other cities globally. However, my particular interest, and this is what I want to turn to in the, in the last part of this talk, is where these, these ecologies of inequality are less stark, are less kind of brutal, and are lived in um, relations of proximity, of encounter, of interaction. Unless we're living in uh, New York City, or Sao Paulo, or Shanghai maybe, you know, these, these mega cities New York's not technically speaking a megacity, but it's a big one, um, marked by really quite pronounced urban inequalities. And um, cities such as New York and other cities in the United States have measures of inequality that are on a par with some of the poorest cities on the planet, which have a very protected um, wealthy elite. But for many of the rest of us, particularly you know, living in cities like Plymouth or cities like London or other European cities where income inequalities are less um, uh, highly spatialized, in fact, the ecology of inequality works in more subtle ways. Relatively rich and relatively disadvantaged tend to live in closer proximity, um, tend to use common kinds of public spaces and common kinds of public services. So how does um, an ecology of inequality get marked in these cases of less stark, less legible, less visible pulling apart? One point of reference for me is this work by Roland Atkinson, an urban sociologist now at York, where he talks about um, what he calls strategies of middle class disaffiliation and colonization. It's a bit of a mouthful. But the strategies that affluent urbanites, relatively affluent urbanites, particularly gentrifying middle classes in the city, use to manage difference, use to manage socioeconomic inequality or cultural difference when they're living um, alongside others who are very different from them. And he identifies these three kinds of strategies, what he calls insulation, incubation, and incarceration. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about incarceration now because I think that is one that we're probably very familiar with as urbanists. Here he's talking about strategies of gating, of withdrawal, uh, you know, gated communities of, of more or less defended enclaves within what, um, uh, you know, within lower income morphologies in the city. There is a lot of literature and a lot of design work done on the issue of gating globally. I'm more interested for our purposes today in these other two strategies of insulation and incubation, which is how people, he claims, how um, 
especially gentrifying middle classes, pad the bunker, manage to uh, live in disparate um, urban contexts, mediate an ecology of inequality at very close range. Either, he says, by insulating certain spaces for middle class use, or by incubating new ones. So we can think about insulation in terms of this kind of tactic of colonization. Um, examples would be uh, the, the sort of monopolization of, of the best school places in urban neighborhoods by more affluent families, or um, sort of colonization of certain cultural and public spa spaces, whether it's pubs or parks or restaurants. And it goes along with these secondary strategies of incubation, transforming spaces into pacified and space, safe spaces for more affluent consumption. So the second one, so the insulation refers, I think, to competition over existing spaces and exercising one's economic, cultural, and social capital in order to ensure that you get a place uh, in the good school or that um, you, know, you can monopolize the barbecue area of the local park or whatever it might be. Whereas incubation refers more to a gentrifying strategy, um, changing, transforming spaces for more elite forms of consumption. Incarceration, of course, is a more stark, a more brutal, a more frontal kind of strategy of fencing. So these kinds of, of strategies of disaffiliation are appropriate to contexts where people, different um, uh, income groups, different cultural groups, different generational groups are living in close proximity. These images are from Kiev, as it so happens, the iPod-wearing urban hipster and um, the uh, elderly urban homeless occupying the same space but living in very different social worlds. And I think if you look at the first photo, you imagine that the dogs are the hipsters, but actually they're the um, homeless woman who's marked out her territory to the right. So it's about living in very close spatial proximity, but managing different kinds of social and cultural worlds, particularly in terms of consumption. And this is where I want to come back to this uh, image in London, which was taken by Claire Mukherjee, um, a, a former master's student of mine. As I said, this is Ashwin Street in Dalston in East London, a very gentrifying area, but one that remains still very economically, socially and culturally mixed. Um, and there is so much in this image, which is not easily apparent just by looking at it, that uh, you know, one could probably write a whole book on it and certainly take up another hour, which I'm not going to do. But the, um, the building on the right is a former um, paintworks. So this is an old industrial building that has been remade. There is gallery space there. There's a rooftop garden up the top with a bar. There's another bar, cafe music space, which is the one that everyone sat outside there, uh, which is, you know, plays really good, very alternative music. It's very much a sort of an in crowd. You have to know about it to go there. And on the other side of the street, um, and you see, you know, the width of the street, you can, it's only sort of enough, a two car width. It's a pretty wide car there, but nonetheless, two cars wide. This is a former synagogue, which is now in use as an evangelical church. So Claire takes this photo on a sunny Sunday where the church congregation is coming out of the ex-synagogue. Um, the con so congregation is uh, wholly a black congregation. Uh, people are dressed up in their Sunday finest. And on the other side, you have the almost wholly white urban hipster grouping um, that are colonizing the other side of the, the street. Different kinds of cultural and social worlds um, within this complex ecology of the city. Now, this isn't necessarily an image of harmony, but it is one of coexistence, of what the political philosopher Iris Marion Young called side-by-side -side particularity. Um, probably a term I should have put up on the slide. It's one that I like in particular it, it, for getting at this coexistence of, of difference, not necessarily lived through interaction or explicit acts of tolerance or harmony, but side-by-side -side particularity, the capacity of cities to support 
difference within very proximate spaces. And the two different groups with their preferred vehicles, the Range Rover of the economically mobile, um, evangelical, Christian, uh, local black family, and the um, fixed gear bicycle of the urban hipster on the other side. But in this image of the same street, you can see a different kind of strategy taking place that we might call colonization or incubation following Atkinson. Here, the, um, if you'll forgive the, the use of this, this term, the sort of hipster contingent has colonized the whole space. It's a street party. Um, it's a gesture of uh, local belonging, of a, you know, an attempt to create a convivial urban scene. But in fact, it's populated entirely by this kind of contingent from this side of the street. So it's a temporary event, but it does make a claim to what is otherwise sh shared urban space in particular ways. Another image taken um, in London, this is Broadway Market, just a little uh, way away from there, less than a mile away. Um, an old street market which had gone into real economic decline into the 1990s and has uh, in the last 10 years undergone a very sort of energized urban re revival and has become this sort of boutique street market. Uh, still quite mixed, the market, but dominated now really by quite high-end um, produce and you know, again you can see the preferred vehicles in this case of the the baby gentrifier in their Christiana bicycle um, cart down the front here. So here the ecology of inequality again being managed by these strategies we might say of incubation which transform spaces for different kinds of consumption still supports a fairly mixed group but one where you see the, the mix shifting towards uh, the more socioeconomically advantaged. And again, another mile away, a different image of that ecology of inequality within the same local area, marked more starkly, of course, this was in uh, the summer of 2011 during the urban riots. This is the, the High Street on Mare Street in the same area, um, a much starker face-off around ecologies of inequality. So in this very, very local space, we see the way in which economic, generational, um, class, ethnic difference gets played out in different ways at different times rather than through Massey's simply very brute um, pulling apart of rich and poor, old and young, hip and square, black and white, um, in spatial as well as in economic terms. I just want to race through um, the last few images so we have some time for discussion. What could any of us as designers hope to do about this? Or what can any of you as designers hope to do about this? Designing for diversity or to support these forms of difference and to uh, secure spaces against insulation, incubation, colonization are in many ways well known as part of the design canon, creating non-exclusionary spaces, uh, supporting different kinds of uses. We sort of know what we have to do, but it can be very hard to pull it off when there is a gentrifying premium attached to many of these strategies. Now, Ash Amin, the urban geographer, puts a great deal of um, investment into very mundane aspects of the urban environment. The first quote, which is not the easiest one to read, but basically boils down to the idea that if people behave well, if people um, behave tolerantly, if people uh, accommodate difference, if people make space for each other in the city, it's not really because they're doing it on purpose or they're thinking about it or this is a very set of conscious and reflexive acts, reflective acts, I should say. He says, actually, people do this unconscious, unconsciously. So it's sort of ethical practice, how to behave ethically towards others is something that we do without thinking about it. Very much guided, he says, by material environments. We should put less emphasis on highfalutin theories of public space and civic virtue. And actually we should put more emphasis on mundane um, built environments and urban fabrics. <laughs> 
where he says, for example, these ordinary, unremarkable aspects of urban form, whether it's the street or the market, as we've just seen, um, parks, buses, well, I think we might have just seen a bus on fire. But anyway, and civic institutions are marked by non-hierarchical relations, openness to influence, new influences and change, and a surfeit of diversity, a lot of diversity, an abundance of diversity. I'm sort of struck by the echoes of Lynch's earlier comment in Armin's word here, this emphasis on openness and capacity for change, but secured by an environment which holds these kinds of differences in very mundane ways, not necessarily by creating um, great civic spaces or very studied self-conscious spaces of encounter and interaction, but which are non-hierarchical, open to new influences and change. I want to finish with uh, some images, with apologies to Christoph who's seen these already, um, that get at both, I think, some of the potentiality of that kind of thinking, but also some of the, the dangers and risks of these small gestures in the city. This is a site at East Croydon in London. It's actually just got planning permission in the last 36 hours, um, which is rather unfortunate, but I guess it was bound to happen once the economic upturn took hold. Uh, it's an area near East Croydon Station. It's, you know, there's a central business district around us. It is a very large, vacant site. It has been vacant for some time. And um, Foster and partners were commissioned to oversee a master plan for this site some few years ago. They were sacked for reasons which are unclear to me, but anyway, they got dropped. The developer dropped the architect from the project, but they did keep the um, small firm, Muff Art and Architecture, who were um, part of the commission to do the landscape architecture. So Muff, as, as one of their partners said, um, hasn't yet been sacked. It was almost like they forgot to sack them. They were too small to notice. And so they kept working on the site and making these very small incursions linked to openness, interested in diversity, um, trying to design connections in this urban space. And the, what, the intervention that perhaps they're best known for was this one. Now this is, um, I don't have the figures at the tip of my tongue, but I, it's something like 900,000 square meters. Is that possible? The, the, that is going to be built overall uh, for this site. The tactic that Muff used to make a small and interim was to lay out two cricket pitches, which are 200 square feet a piece. And the reason why they did this was to create a space of openness and use, but also because Croydon, where this is sited, is the, um, the site of the, one of the UK, um, uh, uh, what's it called? You, some, no, you won't know. As, anyone who's had an encounter with it, the UK border and nationality. Oh. It's the Home Office, but it's called the UK Border Agency, the UK BA office, exactly. It's the Home Office um, branch that deals with immigration and asylum. And they have one of their main offices in Croydon, another in Liverpool. And um, Muff had, had done their due diligence and site observations in the area and noticed that large numbers of um, Afghani men in particular who were settled around the area in hostels because they had to frequently visit while they're waiting for their asylum claims to go through or not. They frequently had to report to the UKBA. Um, and so they laid out cricket pitches. This was a, a use that this particular transient population, to go back to the language of the Chicago school, that zone in tra transition, would make use of, that other local people, particularly young people, would make use of, um, and that would create a space of openness and a space that supported diversity at least for a while. Now, the, the criticisms that are made of this kind of intervention, and they're criticisms that are very hard to defend against, um, is that what this does is to keep this development site warm while waiting for investment capital and waiting for planning permission. The developers have now got planning with a new architect. The cricket pitches, we assume, will disappear. However, as uh, Liza Fiore of, of the practice has said, you know, three years is not a long time in the life of a city, but it's a long time in the life of a child. So if you can create something that someone, either a temporary resident 
or a child can enjoy in the interim, you may make a huge difference to that person's everyday life, even if it is going to, to disappear. So the tension is one between incubation of spaces um, and creating realities on the ground of openness, of diversity, consumption of practices. It's now become an attractive location with new developments going in around this site. And these are the kinds of contradictions, I think, that these sorts of design interventions have to live with. Formed on the basis of the principles that Armin is interested in, but potentially performing the functions of incubation that Atkinson is so concerned about. Now, I have to stop there because I have gone over time. Um, but maybe we can pick up some more of these themes in the last 10 minutes that we have. <laughs>